But let me welcome you to this uh, launch of our second white paper in a series on the uh, following up the Knight Commission uh, on the information needs of communities in a democracy. So uh, I'm Charlie Firestone. I run the Communications and Society Program, uh, part of the Aspen Institute. The Aspen Institute is uh, a organization founded over 60 years ago aimed at enlightened leadership based on timeless values. We're nonpartisan, nonprofit, and we uh, have a series of activities, uh, public activities. Hello. That, 
Hello, we're, we're actually here now uh, starting our launch program. This is the problem with the uh, uh, call ends. Uh, but anyway, uh, the Aspen Institute uh, has a number of policy programs. Uh, the Communications and Society program has been around since the early 1970s. And we look at the impact of communications and information technologies on societal and democratic institutions and values. So we have a number of programs, a number of activities. One of the most significant, maybe the most significant we've done, was in conjunction with the Knight Foundation uh, to create something called the Knight Commission on the Information Needs of Communities in a Democracy, a blue ribbon panel of 17 people of wide uh, political views, uh, and a uh, wide number, uh, uh, a wide variety of uh, skills and experiences. Uh, it was co-chaired by uh, Ted Olson, uh, attorney, and uh, Marissa Mayer, uh, vice president of Google. But it had, uh, anyway, some terrific people. We uh, have the report in the back if anybody has not seen the Knight Commission report. And it's all up on the web at nightcom.org. Uh, the Knight Commission, uh, despite its uh, wide variety of uh, political views and its spectrum of uh, experiences, came out with a unanimous decision, or unanimous report, I should say. No dissenting views uh, with 15 recommendations to have communities more involved uh, and essentially it said uh, that information is as important to the health of a community as clean air, safe streets, and public health. Uh, and then it listed 15 things that it thought were necessary for communities to become healthy, informed communities. Uh, what we've done since then, which was a year ago, is commission a series of eight uh, follow-up reports, we call them white papers, on uh, specific topics of how we might implement these rather general recommendations. Uh, and uh, in this case, we're looking at the recommendation uh, that was uh, number six, saying integrate digital and media literacy as critical elements for education at all levels through collaboration among federal, state, and local education officials. And to uh, author our white paper, which is an independent uh, <coughs> view, it's not the view of the Aspen Institute or, or the Knight Foundation or any of the reviewers, but uh, it did get a, a pretty wide re review process. Uh, we asked Renee Hobbs, who uh, has been in this field since the early uh, uh, 90s, as have we. Uh, I first met Renee at a conference we did in 1992, and we, with this retro report cover, we, I think, uh, Media Literacy, a report on the National Leadership Conference on Media Literacy, and basically found everybody in the country who was involved in media literacy, and we, we did, we, it was beyond a phone booth, but not much more, it was about 25 people. And we uh, came up with some principles for media literacy, and uh, one of the interesting things it said was the most important issue still facing media education in the United States is convincing others of the importance of media education. <laughs> well, here it is uh, almost 20 years later. And, uh, but I, so much has happened in that time. So uh, Renee uh, Hobbs is, uh, has been a leader, not only a leading scholar, but a leading activist in this field. She teaches at Temple University and runs a media education lab and uh, has also been a president of NAMLI, which is National Association of Media Literacy Educators, something like that, mm -hmm. and, uh, and just been uh, a great uh, friend to the media literacy movement. Uh, but this is more than just media literacy, as she will explain. Um, that was uh, very a uh, common term in the in the 90s and we've you know we've talked about information literacy we've talked about news literacy and uh, digital literacy and now we're just I think en encompassing them all in kind of a new literacy uh, rubric but uh, what we're going to do today is uh, have Renee explain we just launched this we just released it at the Family Online Safety Institute annual conference 
about an hour ago, an hour and a half ago. Uh, we have this online for anybody who is uh, online and listening to this or watching us online. Uh, it is at www.nightcom.org. That's K-N-I-G-H-T-C-O-M-M dot org. And uh, so the agenda today will be to have uh, Renee first give us an overview of what it is she has recommended, uh, to have a little question and answer very brief on clarification of her points. And then we're going to go in essentially one by one. And the idea is we've gathered around the table uh, people who uh, represent organizations that can implement the, the measures that uh, Renee is, is recommending. Uh, you're not the only people who can implement it, but you're the first line. And what we're hoping is, is that uh, moving forward, that we will get a little momentum to move this, uh, this idea uh, forward. It's an idea that we're seeing in a variety of places. Uh, we've seen it in the FCC uh, um, National Broadband Plan, and I should then acknowledge our communications and society fellow here, Blair Levin, who oversaw the writing of that plan and also wrote the first of our series in white papers called Universal Broadband, also available online. Finally, before I turn it over to Renee, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Aaron Silliman, who has been our project manager and has uh, really gotten us all here and uh, done a terrific job in, in managing this process. Amy Garmer, who's our director of journalism projects, who uh, has uh, been a uh, uh, indif I can't say it, indefatigable uh, <laughs> editor, uh, and uh, Trisha Kelly, who's also worked very hard on the uh, editing process. So, with that, uh, Renee, tell us about uh, your your white paper. All right. So I'll take about ten minutes to give you an overview of. Of, of what's in the document, um, Charlie made a really interesting observation. You know, uh, 15 years ago, um, there were a handful of people who were exploring um, uh, the new competencies that people need to be able to thrive in an information age. And of course, your presence here and your own work, uh, you already know, this is already on a lot of people's agenda. And in fact, one of the things that was so exciting about um, being able to take the recommendations of the Knight Commission and instantiate it in a set of action steps was the fact that it's so clear there are so many stakeholders who are already at the table, already doing this work, already engaged in the practices, um, that the, the timing just seems like um, a lot of communities, a lot of stakeholders are coming together. And so my question was, what, what might be possible in the next three to five years to continue to build capacity uh, for this work to, to be successful. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, which way am I going here? Yep. There we go. So one of the things I had to do was address the context and heritage of the new literacies that have been uh, emerging. Because of course, any term that I chose was going to have some um, consequence. And the term used in the Knight Commission report, which I really <coughs> like, is digital and media literacy. But really for us to understand what that might mean in 2010, we have to go back to the beginning of the new literacies movement in the 1960s when with um, uh, leadership from a coalition of stakeholders, including the business community and the education community, the portable uh, cameras that were increasingly available to us meant that people were now not just looking at photos, but were taking photos. And the rise of the visual literacy uh, concept and the, the community associated with it has some really interesting parallels. Uh, technology becoming inexpensive, possible to be not just a consumer but a producer, and really understanding that literacy encompasses a whole bunch of different symbol systems, including images. Um, then in the 1970s, when librarians had this incredible uh, uh, development in terms of the the growth of the databases that allowed people to be able to uh, search and retrieve more information more easily. When keyword search was a new idea, uh, we recognized in the, in the, in, in the library uh, community 
that a new set of skills were necessary to sort of manage the information flows and to be skillful in finding information and in using it well. So librarians led the way in helping us see the importance of those uh, skills with their concept of information literacy. In the 1980s when cable television brought a flood uh, 100 and 200 and 300 channels, we had more choices of, of, of entertainment uh, at our fingertips than ever before. The concept of media literacy emerged. The idea that thinking critically about media messages, thinking about how media affect our sense of ourselves, our relationships, our, our choices, our attitudes and our behaviors uh, started to rise. In the <coughs> 90s when the desktop, <coughs> the laptop came to our, into our lives, uh, we needed technology literacy skills. Uh, we needed to know the difference between hardware and software. We needed to know how to store and organize files. We needed to learn how to use the tools in a skillful way. And technology literacy became a really important way for us to think about the new competencies we need. When, when, web went, when the internet went social and became a, a tool for uh, relationships, then internet safety uh, began to rise as we discovered the, uh, for all of the tremendous opportunities for people to use social media to connect with each other, um, there are a slew of miscreants who may use that same set of tools for, for, for unfortunate and unhappy ends. And so the idea of helping um, kids navigate the complex new set of choices in their social relationships as part of in internet safety began to rise. Recently the term Digital citizenship has more broadly invited us to think about the social and ethical responsibilities of being both a consumer and a producer. And we've also seen the use of this term news literacy, the idea of the set of knowledge and skills and attitudes and competencies you need to be able to sort out and evaluate the quality of information provided in news and current events. So in some way, what I tried to do uh, in this paper was create one expansive conceptualization to unite them all. Because it's time, after 50 years, that we start thinking about what connects those new literacies. And so I propose in the paper five big ideas that all of these new literacies share. One is the access skill. When it comes to print literacy, access means reading comprehension. Because those little black squiggles are meaningless unless you lack the reading <coughs> skills to make them meaningful. So th that's an, reading comprehension is an access skill. But so is keyword search. So is using a, a search engine. So is understanding how keywords work. Um, so access is a broad set of skills that involves finding, using, and understanding messages. Analysis skills, really being able to recognize how messages are constructed, how authors uh, convey their um, attitudes and their purposes in messages, thinking critically about how messages have impact on our behaviors and our attitudes, an important skill for digital and media literacy. What has us all excited about this confluence of new literacies is, of course, creativity. The fact is that having access to powerful tools of communication that let us use image, language, sound, interactivity, uh, give us a lot of opportunity as creators and for self-expression purposes. And that's what our young people are finding really exciting about being online. And that's what's enabling the creative community to flower with the kinds of uh, imaginative new ways to share and use uh, information and to entertain ourselves. So we understand how creativity and creative expression is central to thinking about digital and media literacy. Um, but we also think that a big part of the new competencies involves reflecting on our relationships and our social obligations with each other. Um, the idea of having these powerful tools available at our fingertips means we also need to reflect on the impact of our choices as consumers and producers. And that reflective <coughs> stance is not easy to maintain when it's point, click, and wow. In fact, the point, click, and wow is now becoming a problem, short-circuiting the importance of slowing down and thinking about the choices that we make. 
So in fact, we really need to emphasize the importance of being reflective and self-conscious and aware of how we use media and how it serves us and how we, how we can um, be more fully conscious of the choices we make. Uh, oh, this thing is crazy. So, uh, so my apologies for not knowing how to use this piece of technology. The final piece of digital and media literacy is this idea of action. Because in fact, the power of uh, no social change happens without uh, powerful communicators. And we think that digital and media literacy, uh, I think the reason why the Informing Communities report was so influential and so uh, important to us thinking in new ways about the power of information to make people's lives better is that if we use these tools for that purpose, we can expect to see a, a, a great Im improvement in the quality of our lives, in the quality of our democracy, in the quality of our education, in the quality of, of, of work that we do. Um, but only if we use those tools in ways that support those citizenship and community values. So we, we, we understand that's part of what it means to be digital, digitally and media literate. In the report, I offer uh, a, few, uh, rec uh, a few cautions, a few challenges. We don't want to confuse just having tools with having the skill to use it. We want to recognize there really are genuine risks associated with the content of messages, messages that are racist, that are sexist, that are violent, that, are, um, that, that promote uh, fear. Uh, we want to understand the contact the contact risks associated with the social relationships uh, en enabled by Web 2.0. And we want to think about the, the conduct risks associated with illegal downloading and hacking, because these are behaviors that actually um, diminish uh, the potential of these powerful tools to be used to their fullest. Um, we also really need to think hard about making the connection between digital and media literacy and traditional print literacies, because um, if the only reason we're emphasizing digital and media literacy is because um, these tools are so cool uh, and kids like them, then we will have shortchanged the opportunity to get the idea of what literacy really is, the sharing of meaning through symbolic forms. And now we have a whole host of those symbolic forms, uh, but we want to make sure we, we, we build that connection and, and exploit that connection to promote um, as children's academic achievement. Um, we also have to address in a big way this issue of how we develop uh, competencies associated with assessing the credibility of messages. What kinds of knowledge and skills do we use routinely, like just like picking up a cup of coffee that lets us make choices between information that's more and less credible, information that's of higher or lower quality. Being more conscious about those choices is going to be important. Oh my goodness. And finally, the, the, the challenge of addressing uh, news and current events in an increasingly polarized political climate. Um, this is an, these are issues that are, are challenges to the, this field as we move forward. So the report lays out 10 recommendations. I'm going to talk about the first three, which are uh, community level initiatives. The first recommendation, based on those challenges, I was, I, I was uh, trying to imagine capacity building in the next three to five years that basically advances the whole enterprise and builds connections because a lot of stakeholders are going to be needed to make all 300 million Americans digitally and media literate. So the first um, recommendation is to figure out what's going on in communities already. And the Knight uh, Commission's uh, title really suggests this idea that focusing on communities and community capacity, figuring out what uh, already is happening in communities, and then leveraging those resources to address some underserved populations. In this report, we identify parents of young children, um, uh, kids in the juvenile detention system, senior citizens, uh, among several other uh, communities that really would benefit from an infusion of bringing digital and media literacy t to them. The second recommendation under community level initiatives is to support a national network of summer learning programs to integrate digital and media literacy into public charter schools. It turns out that 75% of American children have no summer learning experience. And the research shows very clearly the loss of learning that happens during the summer in urban communities, especially that is profound. As many as a grade level or two, a decline in skills happens so that 
We spend all till December reteaching <coughs> what we were teaching that got lost in that uh, summer break. We see that the fact that digital and media literacy combines fun and learning uh, as a really engaging way to keep kids in a learning mode all summer long using these tools really productively. The third recommendation under community level initiatives we make is supporting a digital and media literacy youth core. The idea here is these would be young adults who would bring digital and media literacy to underserved communities and special populations uh, via the resources available in public libraries, in museums, and community centers. We think the opportunity in the next three to five years to r radically expand the way <coughs> these community organizations uh, embrace the ability, their ability, their unique ability to um, make digital and media literacy competencies part of their mission, part of their mandate. We think there's a real low-hanging fruit there. And You'll, you'll tell us more about uh, the, the, the fact that, that, is, that that's emerging right now on the, on the horizon. When it comes to the next set of initiatives, I really had to tackle one big challenge. And of course, it's been uh, interesting to me my whole life. It turns out that of the three million teachers now in American public schools, the average age is 52. So the average American teacher will be teaching for another 10 years maybe 15 years. And the reality of it is, we can't wait for those teachers to retire. <laughs> we have to find ways to engage teachers in the practice of bringing digital and media literacy into the mainstream curriculum. So I, to, that, to achieve that, I have three recommendations. Or, um, yeah, three recommendations. Um, support interdisciplinary bridge building in higher education that integrates media literacy education into teacher preparation programs by bringing, by taking down some of the silos that exist in higher education and, in, and promoting collaboration. We can really, we're already seeing some fertile movement happening in that area, but if we can ratchet that up and show how that works, um, that's really gonna help the quality of teacher preparation uh, programs. And my next recommendation in partnerships for teacher education, it's number five out of my 10, is to use state, use, use the sort of innovation that's now happening in states to create district level initiatives that uh, support digital and media literacy uh, using the power of the community partnership. Um, there's been a lot of success with this idea of community partnerships with K-12 schools uh, to build capacity. We think the time is really ripe to expand that by supporting that, those initiatives at the state level. Our sixth recommendation is to partner with media and technology companies to bring local and national news media more fully into education programs in ways that promote civic engagement. There's a lot of really interesting innovation happening in the journalism community around making news, you know, taking news off of the newsprint page and bringing it online. And we see communities happening, communities developing um, it around news and journalism but there's a real <coughs> disconnect since the, that all that fertility is not happening so much in either K-12 or higher education context. So we recommend that technology companies and ISPs support um, initiatives that create a kind of mm, catalyst teachers or sort of teacher experts who are comfortable, who are exploring how to bring the new kinds of journalism tools, the new flexible interactive uh, journalism tools like News Trust, which is a kind of an aggregate service where people get to rate the quality of news, or Red Lasso, which lets you basically keyword search local news and clip pieces of local news and then embed those into your own websites and comment on them. We think those tools are really exciting for K-12 and higher education, but we need some leadership that helps teachers learn how to use those tools and apply them to uh, social studies and English language arts and health and other classes. The seventh recommendation is about research and assessment. We have to develop, we, th if, we, if we can move this up forward in the next three to five years, it's gonna help us a lot in the years ahead. Right now, we don't have a good set of tools for assessing learning progression. So I really can't tell the difference whether your 10-year-old has digital and media literacy skills and whether yours doesn't. We don't have those tools. There are two paths that I propose in this report. 
One is to create um, an online uh, assessment tool, 30-minute online test uh, modeled after the really interesting one that uh, Irv Katz developed at ECS for uh, the eye skills, but obviously adapted for fourth graders, seventh graders, eleventh graders. We need that, and we need that now, even if it's not perfect, even if it's only the first step in the bigger process, because we have to begin to figure out how to measure what this looks like. The other recommendation that I have is to create an online video documentation tool that is a shareable resource. Because here's what I notice. Um, a teacher who's trying to integrate this in a health education class in seventh grade has a way of working that's unique to that setting and context. And an after-school program where uh, an, uh, a, a community organization is working after school has a different way of, of doing this. And a library program is going to have a different way of looking at it. Right now, we have no way to build a knowledge base on best practices because we simply don't know what it looks like. And if we had an, an online video documentation tool, we could begin to discover, oh, look, even though these programs are operating in different places, with different kids, with different contexts, there are these shared instructional practices, uh, teacher attitudes, other factors that we can begin to document. If we're going to move this field forward, investing in that now would really do a great, a great service. It would also not only be a, a service in terms of assessment, but it would also be a, a tool for staff development. Because right now, we need hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people to begin to do this work. Well, where do they get the knowledge and skills? How do they learn to do it well? Well, these video documentation, this video documentation tool could really help uh, as a staff development resource to build capacity for the teachers of digital and media literacy. All right, let me get to my last recommendations and then we'll be done. Um, so I was thinking three to five years, all 300 plus million Americans, of course, a lot of this work has to happen in the context of the organizations and institutions responsible for education writ large, right? Public education, higher education, the library and museum community, a nonprofit and civic organizations, sure. But what about adults who are faced with this really interesting paradox? Every year, a new set of tools, every year, a new set of mm, mm, things to use. And this kind of gap between my comfort zone with using technology and what the technology enables. How do we raise visibility among the whole uh, American public in ways that begins to uh, develop a shared understanding of how important these skills are to success in the 21st century? So my eighth recommendation is to engage the entertainment industry's creative community in an entertainment education initiative to raise visibility and create shared social norms regarding ethical behaviors in, in using online social media. It turns out that the Education Entertainment Initiative has been really successful in the past. You could imagine how reality shows and, um, and, and talk shows and morning shows might help to create a kind of familiarity with the discourse of what it means, what online social responsibility means, right? Right now, for a lot of people, that bit of a message is going to go a long way uh, to building a sense of um, importance for this work. Ninth, my, my ninth recommendation to, uh, for national vi visibility and stakeholder engagement actually addresses one of the recommendations in the, in the uh, report that has to do with mobilizing young people to develop digital information and communication capacities. And so we recommend that um, there be support for a statewide youth-produced PSA competition to increase visibility for digital and media literacy. And finally, we need to build leadership. Uh, I recommend, as my final recommendation, holding an annual conference and educator showcase uh, competition that increases national leadership in digital media literacy education and also begins to establish some consensus around those best practices. Excel. All right, 10, <laughs> ten steps, three to five years. We, we look forward to your thoughts and feedback. Great, great. Well, thank you, Renee. And what we're going to do is go right on into discussing uh, each of these.
uh, in, the, in the groupings that uh, Renee made. So the first is uh, supporting community level dig digital and media literacy initiatives. Uh, and uh, Renee suggests right, right at the beginning that to start to have this kind of support, you need some kind of mapping. Um, I'm not sure that any mapping is actually going on, but Susan, uh, go ahead. Well, and by the way, I think, uh, Derek, do they need to, pr no, you don't need, it, it's, uh, act, it's voice activated, so just go ahead and, and speak and we'll, you'll be on the mic. Well, the first thing I thought about, Renee, uh, with this recommendation, which I really love, <clears throat> this is going to be very difficult on a local level, depending who's leading the charge. Um, and so I think it would be really helpful if there was some mapping done nationally. Um, and maybe uh, it could serve as a model of state mapping and then uh, small community mapping. So that there are a whole lot of resources available online today. Um, so that might be a, a really good way to get communities going and maybe if you were uh, trying to raise the money for this, which you would, um, you know, doing the pilot thing, um, following a smaller community. I mean, think of New York City. Uh, you'd probably have to chunk that down quite, quite a bit. But, um, but I love the idea. I think it's a, it's a, so, a great way to so get started. So one of the things, one of the things that uh, I'd like for us to talk about, and this is, you know, real exchange, and we should just join in, but is, who, who needs to do what to get this going? And I'm a little bit afraid if you do it nationally, at your, it's not going to happen as likely as it is if you know, there are some people who can start locally. Let me say one other thing is because we're uh, on phone and on, online, uh, people will identify themselves. We didn't go around and identify. But if you identify yourself before you speak, that was uh, Susan Petroff from the uh, AACT. Right, which is the American Association of Colleges of Teacher Education, because people don't necessarily know the, the acronym. So, uh, Susan, yeah, Hi, Susan I'm Benton. Susan Benton with the Urban Libraries Council, and I apologize for my airplane laryngitis. <laughs> um, I love this idea of mapping. Um, while I am um, with the Urban Libraries Council, my career has been spent until last year working with city and county governments. Mm -hmm. And so, Charlie, when you mentioned the need to think about how we map locally, mm -hmm. I think you're spot on. Uh, cities and counties over the last 20 years have invested a lot of money in creating very sophisticated geographic information systems that initially were just looking at physical attributes, water lines, mm -hmm. streets, but have become much more creative in developing and plotting out where our crime is occurring, where we have different levels of education pockets around the city. Um, last month, I sat in, over a weekend with a group of city managers who spent their entire weekend focused on how do we engage citizens, how do we build community. And so when I think about how you would map, I think you could yeah. really capture and hook a core group of city managers on the importance of adding this to the map. Yeah. Because this is all about engagement yeah. in the 21st century. So I think starting at the Great. local level and starting with some leaders within that community yeah. could be incredibly yeah, um, Let me just point out that the very last uh, uh, recommendation and the Knight Commission report was ensuring that every local community had at least one high quality, and it said online hub, but what it really meant was a map. Mm -hmm. And they used the word hub, and I think after, after the report came out, we started um, refining that. It was really mapping those, that, that very thing, so it's consistent with what, um, what we need, which are these systems, ways of, of mapping. Jessica Gold, Goldfin from the Knight Foundation. Um, yeah, I think that this is hugely important, and we talk about it a lot at Knight Foundation, and in fact, I know that Aspen is working um, towards mapping other sorts of media resources and communities, and so that brings up that while mapping is great, there needs to be some thought put into the risks associated with that as well, and the need for 
yes, at the same time, you want to drill down local and activate these, these assets that you have locally. There, Charlie said it, there needs to be some sort of consistency, otherwise you're just going to keep remapping and rebuilding. <laughs> and so that's very important to understand and identify. And New America Foundation, for example, has mapped, I think, five communities, in, and it's been months. I mean, they've done excellent work, but it's been a lot more difficult than everybody thought just to map media resources and the media landscape of you know five rather large communities. And so I think that when you know this your report is fantastic. And I think, you know, part of this digital revolution means that, you know, these skills are more important than ever, but how do you use these skills to teach these things or to map? And so building in some sort of crowdsourcing or something, but without consistency or standards, it would be a gigantic task and you could spend, you know, your three years just on mapping. Let me just uh, call quickly on Josh uh, Breitbart from the New America Foundation, and you could just uh, have a word about that. Indeed, I know you're you're in there, so I'll, I'll call on you. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it's just as it's just as Jessica says. I mean, it's a very intensive process to, to map a, an ecosystem. You know, it's that old parable <laughs> about a map to the scale of the world, um, especially in the information age. You know, where where do you stop? Um, you know, limit what is a media resource. Um, I think crowdsourcing is certainly an issue. There's also, um, you know, an ethical issue in terms of defining the way, when you map the ecosystem, you also define the ecosystem, and you can wind up defining people out of it mm -hmm. uh, as well as into it. Right. So that's part of the challenge. Right. David Crowley. Hi, David Crowley from Social Capital Inc. We run an AmeriCorps program that does a lot of things that connect people with civic information in local communities. So. The recommendation three I'm especially excited about and we're working okay. on, uh, but it strikes me that you actually tie that to the mapping idea. In fact, we just uh, wrote a concept paper for a National AmeriCorps program on this uh, subject, and w one of the ideas we actually put as a function that a core like that could do is to do some of that mapping. So I think there's some nice ways some of these recommendations can support one another, mm -hmm. and that would be one example. While you have the floor, do you want to uh, at least address that uh, recommendation number three, which is to support a digital media literacy youth core um, that has been suggested also in the National Broadband Plan in one form or another and in some other places? Do you want to sure, address that? Sure, yeah, very exciting to me. Our core and also sort of what we've conceived in this proposal we've worked on to sort of do something like this nationally. Um, is framed slightly differently, not just in digital media literacy. A lot of what our folks do is um, more like managing and creating those online hubs to help people find volunteer opportunities, uh, public meetings, and things like that. But interestingly, when as one of our learning activities last year, we had them read the Knight Commission report and uh, discuss things. They saw our core members saw our natural that the media literacy piece we weren't doing a lot with, but that felt like the kind of stuff we're doing around connecting people to civic information really should be going hand in hand with the media literacy core. So I like the idea, we would just suggest that perhaps the frame of this core, and, and I like that it has a different name besides Geek Core, <laughs> but, but that concept I think maybe just slightly broader that might have a few facets, one being media literacy, mm -hmm. other being actually creating and aggregating civic information and making sure it gets out so there efficiently. Uh, which Civic literacy is another one of those new literacies that have been has been talking about. Yeah. One more question, which is, what would be the next step to make that uh, to get that happening? Maybe out of AmeriCorps, or maybe yeah. some some other way. I think I, I know in the original original night report, it did sound a little bit like perhaps a new program and uh, alongside Peace Corps and AmeriCorps. But I think there's definitely ample room within AmeriCorps. There is language in the statute that allows for something just like this, and so. The f one step for us, I mean, I know the recommendation here was for a set aside. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy if that happened. That's a tough, tough road to hoe. So, you know, part of our tactic has been to actually, you know, one of the best ways, you know, is to simply s s go into the AmeriCorps application process and try to say, hey, you know, you say this is an allowable activity, give us some money, we'll figure out how to do that. So we have, we're, we're trying to get a planning grant to sort of mm -hmm. build out and engage people in sort of a national plan for trying to get something something going. It might not that might not be the way to hold, fund the whole enchilada, but at least to get a start. Okay, Adit Kaper. Adit Kaper. Yeah, I'm the president of the Worldwide Workshop Foundation and I think uh, our social network for learning uh, game media literacy, which uh, is presented here in the report. So um, 
to talk to build on what Jessica uh, from Knight was saying and to really first respond to the recommendation of mapping I think if we what what's what's missing here is actually in many ways the plan to action I think this is if we really want state chiefs and education chiefs and media company to respond I would highly recommend to extract a much smaller uh, plan to action uh, and as we talk about mapping the appendix for example is a kind of mapping, but it's not done in a Web 2.0 way. Mapping in itself is media and digital literacy. What is mapping, right? So 300 million Americans or 50 million American students need to be able to be digitally literate enough to know how to map everything that they do in their community. So in itself is actually an amazing educational activity. Uh, and I would recommend to take the appendix and only include... Uh, as an example, as a model for mapping, those organizations or activities that are right away rated very high, they really exist, people can come and do them immediately. It's very clear what are the meta tags. Is it a summer program? Is it a 100-hour curriculum in school, for middle school, elementary school, high school, community college? Is it uh, a teacher preparation program? What is it? So I think unless the appendix is references, I think we need to kind of do what we preach. So I highly recommend to put that online sooner rather than later and make it an example of mapping of community resources. Um, on that note, the yeah. appendix is online on the nightcom.org um, site. But just as a it's link. Under, no, it's, well, it's, it's under, uh, right now it's called Portraits of Success, so we're featuring, featuring each one as something successful. You're right, the, the mapping piece of it isn't obvious in that, but it, it's pulled up. So I'll say this again, Amy, differentiate between Portraits of Success or references to stuff that exists versus uh, really understanding what categories, what is an expert digital citizen, what are these programs about, and how they can be by the communities who created them and those who use them in many places be mapped, weighted, ready to act mm -hmm. upon, right? So we need to be beyond just references mm -hmm. of success portraits. Yep. We need to become a model for yep. how we do digital yep. citizenship with the information that is here yep. a little bit better. Yeah, and so to tie that together, Jessica, Josh, Edith, and David all say, well, so then let's get a, a group together to figure out what are the terms, because the, the who's in and who's out is complicated. It's not everything, right? But it's it could be delineated. And then how do we make it dynamic so that it essentially it, it can grow and ch it can grow and change and, and, and take advantage of you know the whole community to so that it stays alive, right? It's in a dead document, but it's, it's, it stays alive forever. Okay, let's go beyond the mapping now, and Roberta Stevens from the American Library Association, or maybe you're still ma mapping, but <laughs> I'd like to try to move on if we can. Well, I, I just want to make one final comment, because I okay. think that this mapping is the levels of mapping, and I think that's what you were getting at, is that there is a mapping of, you know, what instruction, for instance, is occurring in the literacies, and then there's a mapping of what resources actually exist right. And I think when you come to the point where you're doing the definitions, I think that's what we also get to, get to. We really need to get that kind of information. And, and uh, speaking about that, of course, we would be very willing to work with you. But the American Library Association, you know, it's an association of all, you know, all kinds of 63,000 members. But the bottom line is you've got 122,000 school libraries in the U.S. You've got whatever, like seven or 8,000 academic libraries, and we've got... 16,000 16, 16, or so public libraries. So, and all, and the mission, you know, our whole purpose, what we do by our very nature, is we are equipping individuals and, and trying to guide in the development of information and communications and technological literacy. That's what we're doing every single day. But, there, but that's a level. That's one level. We're dealing with people one on one. There's also the level of instructing in the broader sense to go out a librarian or become a teacher and teach that. So that's that's just the little points. I think it needs to be differentiated. So um, and I think you know our whole intent was that uh, public libraries and actually recommendation seven, which we didn't do a separate white paper for, but in the Knight Commission report, act, uh, recommendation number seven says fund and support public libraries and other community institutions as centers of digital and media liter uh, training, especially for adults. So just, just to be, uh, at least you know that the 
commission itself was very supportive of the public library uh, function generally, but particularly in terms of media and digital literacy for adults. We know that children go there too, and a lot of people, a lot of others, but. And I would amplify on your recommendation to say, really, there should be that support for the school libraries. The school libraries have been working on this since 1937, talking about you know information literacy, and they are really way out in front on the 21st century skills. So it's not just supporting public libraries, yes, adults, but yeah. children use them too, and get the same instruction yeah. that the school libraries are absolutely pivotal if you have qualified people as a school librarian. So let me just, uh, well, uh, yeah. Larry why Levin, F uh, Aspen Institute. Why isn't this a problem solved by an algorithm? <coughs> what? Can't, I mean, can't you write an algorithm? I could, but some of could. <laughs> yeah. Uh, write an algorithm which essentially, I mean, all, all the mapping stuff that really works great is because, in fact, nobody's actually doing anything kind of does it itself. And, I, and the, the problem, as I'm reading it, and I really don't understand this stuff well, is you, it makes it sound like it's, it's just a local problem where I'm just saying if you had a kind of the right algorithm that was able to go into the net and discover where all of these resources are and create maps, as a lot of different software does, doesn't, in other words, instead of having a lot of local grants, can't, should it be a kind of challenge grant for a algorithm writer to come up with something that Okay, we're gonna get one more comment and, and then we're gonna move off of mapping because we've got ten other rec five, nine other recommendations. Yes. Hi Renee. So I'm Mark Tomizel. I know David I oh I'm sorry, Mark Tomizel, I'm a citizen, okay? Who works with people who do all the stuff you're talking about. You're right, it's an algorithm. There are already people doing maps. Ushahidi used a map to save lives in Haiti. That was funded by Omidyar. Omidyar will get behind this because they were at MIT Legatum last week, okay? Gates, I think, will too. So the algorithm is right. The mapping is exactly right. We need to start with what resources do we have? What people are out there who are willing to do things without being paid? It's called being a citizen or a neighbor. Open source. Open source. But then you can have a map that has live experience built into it. So you use broadband to have very productive conversations about solving multi-million dollar problems. If you ask Governor Ed Rendell, he will tell you that on May 1st of last year at Harvard, he said he would pay task forces of citizens to solve problems in hospitals, schools, and other places because we're choking on red tape. So these models are actually quite good if you unleash through an algorithm a plan and let everybody then kick in as neighbors, you will find an un unbelievable reversal of brain drain so in this need, country. What needs to happen to have that uh, I mean, I, I think there's a lot more, but what needs to happen to get that started? It needs to be easier to get ideas into Washington, D.C. than faking your way in by wearing a tuxedo and pretending to be a friend. No, but we, we could Literally. It's not a Washington, D.C. funded. No, no, no. What I'm saying is people are ready to go, amazingly creative people, people who make industries, who make markets every day. They want to know it's under the right conditions. D.C. and other places, except for Renee, ivory tower places tend to prescribe an approach that becomes not so good for the people who actually know what they're doing hands-on. So if you make it attractive and make it an invitation, people will come. But if you over-prescribe how they can be involved, they will leave the potluck party before getting there. Okay, and that's what, and Renee and I have talked about how to just fire up kids systematically <coughs> as problem solvers, as gatherers of data in their local communities. By the way, the independent sector people, that was two weeks ago in Atlanta, I think you'll find that they would love to do this. I think you'll find that the Pete Peterson people, the Concord Coalition, are ready to do this kind so of mapping. So all these people want to do it, but you're saying, I mean, are you saying that Washington is stopping them? I mean, what's stopping them? What's, what's stopping them is I found out about this morning at 6 o'clock, this meeting this morning at 6 o'clock by email. It's not easy to know where these meetings are happening. It's not easy to say, I've got pieces of the puzzle. Blair will tell you that I was there at the commission hearings, multiple commission hearings. Um, David will tell you that I've worked with him in Boston. These patterns are there. It just becomes hard to get the pattern into the system in a way that the system recognizes the pattern. Okay. So I'm happy to contribute more, and this isn't for me. This bracelet's for my daughter, who's nine, okay. and for my son, who's 17. They actually work the way we all know they can work. Okay. Let's move. Yes. 
Commissioner Michael Mike Cobb. Cops from the FCC. You know, we've spent the first part of this discussion talking about what a profound problem this is, and I couldn't agree more how what we are talking about goes to our future as a country, the ability of our citizens to engage, to educate themselves. So, you know, I'm all enthused, and I'm brought into this, and I'm bought into it when we got Blair's plan and the Knight Commission and everything else. Now, all of a sudden, well, we're in the kind of painless solution. Washington doesn't have a role. Let the kids uh, bloom, uh, uh, find an algorithm somewhere. And all those things may be helpful. But if this is a national priority, then let's act like it's a national priority. And that doesn't mean that government has to step in and prescribe everything you do or uh, anything like that. But it means government uh, encourages this as a priority hopefully supply some wherewithal to encourage the own account, the, the public-private partnerships that are going to be essential uh, for this to take off and, uh, and, and to conduct our policies uh, around it. Now, I'm always leery when somebody asks, what can the FCC do? Because right now nobody knows the FCC can do much of anything. We're kind of waiting for an answer to that. But uh, hopefully we will come out with an answer that, uh, uh, that we can help this process. I don't care who does it. I think there is good follow-up coming after the, end of the National Broadband Plan and all these other things, there is interagency uh, cooperation. The FCC is taking part, of, uh, taking part in that. NTIA is doing a part of that. Obviously, the Department of Education. So, I, uh, and just reference the mapping for a second. Uh, I applaud all that, uh, that local mapping, but it also has uh, a national purpose. And we talked about national purposes in our broadband plan. And it's to get all, uh, all of these folks not only educated but uh, engaged and everything else. This is going to take a long time to solve this problem. We're talking about revamping the educational system, revamping all kinds of things. And that's why I have been talking so much about kind of a down payment on media literacy, something that we could do right now in the next year or so if we could. There's so much out there already, and people have alluded to it. If I'm interested in a K through 12 media and digital literacy program online as a down payment toward media literacy. There's so much stuff out there already. If we could get the FCC or NTIA or the Department of Education, uh, the White House certainly has to, has to bless, uh, bless this and be, be a part of it to convene the players in the public-private sector who have curriculums up already, who have courses up there. So many people come through my office week after week after week, and they're talking about the innovative and creative stuff they're doing. One that comes through the next week doesn't know what the one that was there the first week is even doing. So we need to get that kind of inventory. That's mapping. I don't know if that's local mapping or national mapping or technology mapping or whatever you call it what you will. But that's, uh, that's what we need. And then take something like that, get those courses, put them up online. Uh, school districts uh, fear federal intrusion. They don't want a part of it. They can ignore it. Uh, I suspect most of them would be happy to have that as an interim tool while we do all these other comprehensive things to try to change the education system of the country to encourage digital and uh, media literacy. And then, uh, you know, maybe we ought to consider, and uh, probably some people will like this, uh, uh, maybe we ought to be uh, considering what the public interest responsibilities are of not just uh, traditional media, but new media also uh, to help, uh, help carry this out and, and educate our kids and uh, educate all of us on digital and media literacy. Great. Uh, what we're going to do, perfect, because I was going to call on you anyway. <laughs> Quasi, is it Asari or, uh, from the uh, U.S. Department of Education? And, uh, right? And uh, I uh, would like to have us also bring in, if you would, uh, the, the third item in this um, cluster, which is uh, national network of summer learning programs to integrate digital and media literacy into uh, public charter schools. <coughs> um, but maybe you could react to what's been going on. Uh, I, I'll react sort of recursively uh, to some of that. Uh, I think that one, I, w I wanted to be very clear that if we're going to try to do this for, for, for our schools, we should be doing it for our schools. Right? So I, I I sort of cringe at the notion of separation of charter schools versus public schools, right? Uh, this should be something, if we want to encourage, we should make sure we encourage it for our schools, our public schools. Um, I, I think that if, if we take a step back and I try to think about how do you sort of encourage the right sort of behaviors uh, at a, a broader level, uh, I think there are 
entities and organizations uh, at the department amongst cabinet organizations that have things like the ability to, to offer incentives to do so. Uh, the, go the government has a tremendous opportunity to actually create or facilitate or make markets attractive, right? Uh, and I think in other spaces and other industries that outside of education, uh, they've actually had some me measure of success. Defense comes to mind. Uh, we've actually been able to sort of create incentives for people to participate in a way where they can actually find some sort of a return on their, act their activity, whether that's a triple bottom line, social benefit, environmental, uh, financial, whatever, what have you. Uh, we have the ability to sort of create or facilitate marketplaces. Uh, so where am I going with this? Uh, m marketplaces in education are broken. No surprise to anybody uh, in this room. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of people sitting around their garages looking for the next great education startup. Uh, it just usually doesn't happen. Uh, the incentive to do so is low. Uh, the risk uh, is fairly high, and the reward is usually fairly low. And the ability to actually deliver is, is problematic. Uh, one of the things that we can do to sort of encourage the right type of behaviors, I think, are the power of, of challenges and prizes. And you've seen it start to happen in some other, other places. Uh, and I think you can actually move towards a, a digital literacy challenge or incentive that actually creates the right type of behaviors. Uh, I think on, on two levels that's in particularly of importance and interest uh, for, for us. From a research and development standpoint, I think there's opportunity to do some of these things a little bit differently. You mentioned the notion that we can't wait for our teachers to retire. Uh, I, I cringe when I hear that as well. Um, uh, Blair was at uh, our, our session, uh, the CETA session earlier this week, and he kind of raised the phone in the room and sort of did one of those uh, informal you know, uh, assessments of the, the room and asked how many people actually had evidence that their, their smartphone was effective before they actually ultimately ended up per deciding to purchase the smartphone. And, and of course, nobody did. And, and the reason is because Apple didn't do that before they actually launched the solution in the, into the marketplace. Uh, in education, we, we don't do that. We, we need our gold standard RCTs, which take five years for us to discover that the Palm Pilot is an effective intervention in the classroom, after which, of course, it was using Palm Pilot, right? So uh, the idea that we can actually use research and development to think about things like ease of use comes to mind, right? Uh, how do we make it easier for our caregivers, our educators, to actually provide the right types of digital material, digital literacy materials and tools in the, in the classroom? How many of us got professional development to use Facebook, right? How long was that, that lead cycle like? Uh, the challenge is that creating or deploying uh, easy to use things is hard, right? Making the, the simple complicated is, is routine. We all do it all the time. Making the complicated simple is, is sublime. Uh, and Chris was on a panel with me earlier la last week, so he's kind of heard me give the story. Uh, my father is a college professor, and one of his levels for uh, excellence is to make sure that as he teaches a course or, or uh, a topic, that everyone leaves the room saying what an idiot he was because the bar was so low that they all kind of got what he was talking about. If they leave the classroom and say, boy, that guy is really smart. You know, he knows he's failed, right? Making really hard things to communicate efficaciously is difficult, right? That's why folks like the Microsofts of the world, uh, the Apples of the world, have a lot of ability to be successful. So the design research that needs to go into how do you actually provide force multiplying capacity to our education force is what I'd really want to think about doing prizes and challenges for, right? And there are lots of different authorities in the department that, uh, and across agencies that have the ability to provide prize and challenge authority. Uh, and we're, I think, working in coordination to think about how those challenges might, might come to fruition. So I think it's one, one part of your, 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 your I think, your, your thought process is we need to think about the research and design effort around ease of use for delivering these things uh, a lot differently. That includes development of platforms. The second part which I would think about is uh, thinking about how we can actually reach out to our early ed educators as well. Uh, I was with Alan Kay earlier this week, and he, he talked to me about how he was actually able to build towards uh, uh, a model of education where he had fifth graders doing uh, Galileic equations based on empirical experiences, which my jaw just kind of dropped to the floor. One, because I still can't differentiate, you know, and math was never really my strong suit. Uh, but two, that he, he was actually able to sort of model how you kind of get to this destination. And he said, you know, you, you begin early, you know, you do it often, right? So, you know, vote early, vote often, uh, and get the kids acclimated and acculturated to what we're talking about here. So. Uh, I, in education, we chase deficits. By the time our kids get to kindergarten, 
you know, those million words that, you know, their peers that have the wherewithal to be successful with, you know, we, we, ne we never close that gap. And we spend the rest of our time trying to close the, these deficits. Uh, you, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. So I, I was so, I was happy when I saw the Kaiser, you know, study around, you know, pass back, that the kids are going to get these things anyway. Uh, let's think about how we make these experiences high quality uh, so that when they get to kindergarten, they're not in a position where they think it's okay to do some of the reprehensible things that they do to some of the, each other because they've been acclimated to appropriate climate. Uh, now, I think part of that conversation means how do you prepare that, that early education force to be more prepared, right? So I think there's also effort uh, that needs to be played into and, that And that type feeds right into our, which we're moving into this next group, which is, uh, and I'll get, is developing partnerships for teacher education, sort of getting involved in that. I also, though, uh, Kwasi, want to ask you about the national, uh, anyway, the, the Department of Education released its uh, national education tech plan. Tech plan. What's it called? National Education Technology. Yeah. National, National Education Technology Plan yesterday. So yep. we are. Uh, I think we had perfect timing on uh, scheduling this. We. Uh, but is there something in there that, uh, in some way, relates to what we're talking about here today? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, one, one, a couple of. It, it's so. For those of you who haven't read the plan, there's five sections. There's a learning and a teaching and uh, assessment and productivity and infrastructure section. The grand challenge section, I think, speaks directly to kind of the things I've been you know, opining about for 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 a minute now. Uh, the the notion of highly connected teachers, right? Uh, because we're talking about these things that happen in discrete places all over the country and how do you take these, these things to scale uh, becomes really, really important. One of the things that we're working on are these online communities of practice. Uh, and actually, I think we'll be working in partnership with a lot of the different agencies to sort of sort, sort this, this conversation out. Teachers that are connected to all the right resources to make all the best decisions you know, in real time as, as they, the best they possibly can. We ask our teachers to make a million different decisions you know, every day. And the idea that we can act, we're, we're trying to force them to make these things by, decisions by themselves, uh, really, you know, I, I have a hard time with that in an environment where we've got access to technology that can take some of these conversations some level of scale. So as we're trying to sort out what is the wireless policy, you know, in PG County versus what's the wireless policy in Charlotte, North Carolina, is there a way for me to actually have a conversation at scale with another uh, director or another uh, thought leader that, tell, that talks about how do they work through their acceptable use or their meaningful use policy in their district to level where actually they had the buy-in from their community, their stakeholders, the people, the parents, uh, as well as all the people who provide solutions, you know, to, to the, those districts. So the conversation around creating platforms for having these conversations happen, I think, becomes really, really important. And I think included in that conversation are the dialogues around what is an appropriate uh, level of, of engagement and dialogue around digital media resources, digital media assets, uh, and the ability for us to get to a, a level of, of efficiency around around learning. I think the race to the top assessments I think are going to be really very interesting. You guys call for an opportunity to, to evaluate uh, the effectiveness or the ability to and analyze uh, new media in a different way. Uh, I think leveraging online platforms will give us a tremendous opportunity to think about how we might do these things a, a little bit differently. So I think I, I won't dominate the mic, but yes, throughout the National Education Technology Plan there are multiple entry points for us to talk about digital literacy, digital media, and different ways we can actually uh, improve uh, learning outcomes associated uh, with uh, 21st century uh, learning okay. opportunities. So Robin Brock, Creative Coalition. Hi, just for those of you, just quickly what the Creative Coalition is, we're the uh, nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan uh, 501c3 advocacy arm of the entertainment industry. And we've been looking at media literacy for a long time, and we worked with Renee probably a decade ago. Uh, but specifically to uh, use the assets of the entertainment industry to promote uh, the social need for media literacy. And not to simplify things, but what I wanted to offer up to this group is that our whole mission of the Creative Coalition is to use entertainment to promote issues of social importance. And we all know that entertainment can influence for the, for the good as well as the bad. And because media literacy has become a life and death issue, uh, you know, with Columbine being, you know, media being blamed for Columbine to everything for kids being obese because they're watching too much TV. Um, I think that we sh what I'd like to offer up to the group is to, is to use our organization to do a public service campaign to educate. I, I think you need to educate the masses, and it needs to go from an academic, why we need digital media literacy, to a gut 
efficacy uh, for parents, caregivers, and educators to understand the very simple lexicon that media literacy can save lives. And, and I just wanted to offer that up. That's that, you great. Know, and we, in we, fact, maybe uh, since you did raise it, let me just move over to the teacher training. For, you know, I'm just going to go out of order now. But uh, on the parent outreach, national visibility, stakeholder engagement, two of the recommendations fit right into that. First is to engage the entertainment industry's uh, creative community in an a entertainment education initiative to raise, raise visibility. Um, so uh, that's one aspect, and I, I think, you know, to the extent we can, and I, I think what you have in mind there also is maybe some uh, into some scripts, into some, mm -hmm. you know, it's behavioral. Of course, everybody wants to do that; they get their issue in there. But this well, is a it's changing behavior. Up for safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That we can, and, and what's good about, you know, I can, we can harness the best creative minds to change the so lexicon. How, to change the lexicon. So is there something that we can do to get this issue into the, uh, into the, those script meetings <laughs> and into those, uh, you know, so that uh, as they're talking about, you know, the kids in some sitcom are being cool <laughs> and using their phone, that they have some element that they're teaching of. Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we do, in fact, we're doing something next month on skin cancer. We have all the, um, the writers and executive producers and showrunners coming from the top television and, and cable shows coming in so that whenever they're writing into us, for example, whenever they're writing into a script that the kids are on the beach or they're going outside, they're going to be putting on sunblock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, and that's what we do, and that's yeah. what we do best. And I think that entertainment can influence. I think that we should harness it. This is an industry also that's directly related, you know, as Michael knows, this is, you know, this industry wants kids to be media literate and doesn't want, you know, the, the, the opposite of, of legislation and FCC well, the, coming down. Them, the, so. the other side, the, the advantage of media literacy to uh, your community is that the more we put the uh, responsibility on the viewer, the less we are inclined to censor the producer. Uh, so it actually has a direct, Oh, I it's think, a pocketbook uh, issue, too. Yeah. Um, the second one is to host a statewide youth-produced public service announcement uh, competition to increase visibility for digital media literacy education. So, Done. again. <laughs> Done. Yeah. We'll do it. Good. Okay. So maybe we can uh, have some follow-up on that. While we're on this, uh, and, you know, I'm just going to finish up this one. Unless Does anybody have anything to add to those two items? And if so, um, uh, then the third one is a national conference. Um, Mamie. I just could add to I'm Mamie Bittner from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And, and very happy to see the word museum as well as library in the report. Thanks uh, very, very much. I believe that uh, uh, museums are um, underutilized resources, tremendously valuable in uh, education and digital literacy uh, in communities across country. Uh, so there are, there are many different ways I'd like to engage here, but I think I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the summer. Um, uh, as uh, Quasi says, it needs to be all schools, uh, but also kids live in communities, and uh, uh, libraries are tremendously adept at summer learning. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, there, I don't think there is a library in the country that doesn't do something around summer, and it, many, many libraries have expanded that well beyond books. Um, we, ha we are doing a series of conversations uh, across the United States that we're calling Making the Learning Connection, that we're bringing museums, libraries, uh, education, workforce together to have conversations about, uh, it's, it's not algorithms uh, and it's not a high tech mapping, but it's about people mapping uh, to each other about the things that they're doing in communities that uh, they could have synergies around. And it's quite powerful and it's quite amazing how many people in communities don't have the opportunity to talk together about this, mm. this work. So uh, engaging these community resources in um, the summer learning and, and the other uh, initiatives is, I think, uh, quite important. Okay, great. Uh, just to finish up those last three things, Adit and David. <coughs> I, I, I want to build on what uh, Michael and Kwasi were saying. I think that we are trying to create a plan of action for towards immersion or immersive participation in digital learning for everyone as the national <coughs> tech plan, and that uh, we have pluralistic practices 
that already exist that need to be highlighted. And there is, uh, as, as Renee was trying really well to combine the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and lead us into the future and, and the action of now, what to do next Monday, I think that some of the language is a little bit above the past because language related to messages may need to be turned into experiences. And messages uh, that are um, uh, TV entertainment should really pay careful attention to the power and billions of hours every week and billions of dollars of the gaming industry. And I think the computational literacy and the game media literacy, which is really the new literacy uh, that rides on networks, on broadband learning networks, is, is, is not enough emphasized here in terms of the call for action that exists in the, in the broadband learning uh, documents, in the national tech plans, in, in things that the FCC is, is, is trying to make happen. And that I think we need to maybe think about that, uh, that maybe everything we're discussing here and everything that is in this report should call for building a network, right? Building a network that has, whether it's, it's mapping or, or libraries engagement or professional development or any kind of thing, I think that it all needs to really ride on broadband networks right now. Okay, David? Yeah, I just wanted to add, as we're thinking about the message we want to convey here, that I think it was covered somewhat in the report, sort of how the pendulum can swing from a, sort of a concern, preoccupation with the safety side of the problem, and then just unfettered optimism that, you know, not based in reality. But I guess given some of the incidents of late, certainly what I see in local districts and communities around me is definitely on the so preoccupied with safety side of the equation that sort of the idea, I, I think it's going to take a lot, I think we can't understate how many districts or, or parents even are going to just say the way to deal with this is to, you know, just figure, you know, don't let anybody on Facebook, it's just sort of hunker, a hunkering down effect. And, and I worry, in the report also, it's interesting how it points out you know, not surprisingly that, you know, parents who have grad degrees are doing the media literacy stuff at home. If we don't really hit this head on and hard, it's, you know, this, this can be something that just even exacerbates the divides we already worry about in education. So. But can you use that uh, instinct or that, you know, desire, oh, let's clamp down, and turn it into a positive force for uh, greater media literacy, uh, you know, Greater digital education. I do think it. I do think it is a teachable moment, but I think it's going to. It's good we have the creative uh, folks interested in helping with that messaging because what I see the first instinct of people for whom this is not, you know, in my, you know, our school committee in my town, where this isn't their top priority. You know, it's just you know, it's always just about the, you know, how do you keep this away from your mm -hmm. kids, kind of, or how do you stop all the negative side of it? And I feel like. Um, you know, it's going to take some powerful messaging for people to see the potential of this. Yeah. Alan and Simpson from Alan Common Simpson Sense. Alan Simpson from Common Sense Media. I would oh agree God. with both of those points and, and say oh there's an enormous opportunity, and Renee spoke very eloquently about it this morning at the Family Online Safety Institute about empowerment and engagement as safety tools. But I think, and, and I think that is a ripe territory, but I think the other part of it I want to connect back to what Robin said. These may be these lessons may be too large, and I don't think you're going to get a lot of reception to a digital media and literacy campaign in a local community as much as you are a message about sunscreen and skin cancer, or a message about here's how this is a great tool towards safety. It's it's not just that it's teachable; it's also that it's a moment. It's it's something that a parent or a community member can grasp onto and then get into a larger conversation about the things we're discussing here. But we've got to hook them on something smaller than digital media and liter digital media literacy. So are you suggesting that uh, this is a way of empowering local uh, citizens to take on this issue? Empowering them and engaging them in, and, and networking them to others in, in, in their experiences. who are working on this. But I think what draws parents to this, what we've learned is, it's either a pain point or an opportunity point. It's not the broad issue that, that we're all engaged in. It, it starts with, I'm worried about Facebook for my kids. Or it starts with, I, I, read, I saw this great message about sunscreen. Yeah, speaking of that. So Michael Rich, Center for Media and Child Health. You, you, One of the things is I, I think that 
we've hit on this concept of the, the polarized environment, you know, and it's not just polarized as in a long history of an assumption that anybody who's concerned about media is anti-media, you know, and so everybody falls into their, you know, dug-in positions. Um, but it's also among the community, too, is that parents do go to the pain point or the opportunity point, but have a hard time going to both at once. I think something that's going on out there that we may want to learn from is bullying right now, mm -hmm. in the sense that bullying initiatives used to be about policing and cracking down on the bullies. And, you know, it was always slamming the door after the horse was out of the barn. And when we realized, first of all, that bullies were, in fact, victims as well, and that it was part of everybody protecting themselves no, and protecting their society, and that it became the responsibility of every member of the school, not just the teachers and the principals, but the kids too. Um, and if we can apply that model, that inside-out model, to digital empowerment and engagement, um, these kids will protect themselves. Um, and the kids are the digital natives. They're better at this than we are anyway. So if we can engage them from the inside out and building their self-esteem, their respect for each other and themselves, and give them the tools to do it, and then just get out of their way. I okay. Think we'll that succeed. then uh, does segue into what I want to talk about next, but I'm, I'm going to call on Jessica Goldfin. But then I would definitely want to move to the teacher education because you do have the situation where the children are the, as you said, digital natives. Uh, I always thought parental controls were funny because, you know, the kids might let the parents watch the television, uh, you know, <laughs> what they wanted. But uh, let's get into the teacher education since we, after we hear from Jessica. No, that's actually a great segue just to kind of tie it all back. Um, so Knight Foundation, a lot of our work, and this is, I promise, this is related, um, a lot of our work right now deals with what's going on in the news industry and, and trying to understand how there's now the, it's, it's not enough to just do good work. It's not enough to just, you know, know who your audience is, but now you, we have the incredible opportunity to be very, very strategic. And I personally, and I, you know, I'm not going to speak on behalf of Knight Foundation, but I think that we all are kind of at this point where it doesn't have to be an either or. It can be as many different you know, sunscreen, whatever, all those sorts of messaging and talking about teachers, it also doesn't have to be an either or, a traditional or a, or a new kind of strategy. I mean, we have the ability now to parse down messages to the most strategic outreach, you know, engagement type strategies where maybe you have those teachers that are 52 and they're going to be comfortable in this way and so recognizing what their comfort level is so that you can then lower the barrier so that they do adopt those tools or bring it in is going to be very different from maybe a 20 year old mm -hmm. Teach for America kid who studied computer engineering who's right. in the school is going to be very different from, right. you know, uh, somebody in one of the libraries who has a different skill set and so, you know, we have parents, everything, we can be very, very strategic and to kind of bring it back to the, we're, we're experiencing this right now with a lot of our grant making with news organizations where, you know, seeing them being able to segment their audience, I mean, speaking to Robin, really understanding audience in a way is going to be really effective when we think about all of these things, especially the teacher kind of comfort because it's that, it's like this weird tension between effectiveness of the approach and teacher comfort and it shouldn't have to be an either or because we can it's, it's very cost effective now, and especially in the long term, to really understand how are you going to reach these teachers in this way. And I think going back to Adit's point, with the networked approach, I know with your program Glo Global Loria, creating these networks of teachers to activate teachers within schools. Maybe you get to this teacher who's really excited about it. They're going to be more influential to this teacher. You know, and then there's already that support targeted to them so that they can buy in. So I mean, it's just, I think a little ethnography could go a long way. Okay, so we're now looking at uh, ways of engaging teachers, getting teachers to integrate this into the class, into the different classrooms, ways of uh, engaging media and uh, teacher groups. And so uh, the two people next to you on both sides are, you know, Christopher uh, Losi from the uh, uh, chief school officers. Council of Chief State School Officers, CCSSO. Uh, you know, is there, are there programs here? Is there something here that we can do with the CCSSO uh, group? Uh, and then Susan uh, Petroff, maybe you can address it with the teachers uh, organization. Uh, yeah, I think there's a ton that we could do with uh, state education leaders. I think, and thanks for calling them out, Renee, in your opening comments, how it is that policymakers might be able to engage in this. Uh, 
Sure. So, so state policymakers, I think, are particularly interested in the kind of condition setting. And I think in terms of condition setting, we see a really strong commitment to digital and media literacy. In fact, I think all of the essential competencies that you talked about here, these five essential competencies, are embedded in the common core academic standards that are now being adopted by, as of this point in time, 36 states. Uh, we've been leading that effort with the National Governors Association. But of course, uh, while there's some condition setting that the, the chiefs are primarily responsible for, they're always inviting other people in to help understand how they can better do that work. And that work is far from being done, just sort of raising your hand and saying, we're going to do it. doesn't mean that you've implemented those standards. Uh, and one of the key components that Kwesi brought up uh, really well was that we need to actually construct now the assessments that go along mm -hmm. with those standards. And I think that as we begin to say, how is it that in the assessment protocols we can actually begin to instantiate all of these digital media literacy principles that we're talking about? How can we actually make it real that we're going to ask a student to be able to do these things? Uh, we can begin to move uh, toward an, a set of expectations that will manifest itself in terms of different behaviors for teachers. So one of the things that we keep talking about is that the, the, the common core academic standards for students is just the beginning of trying to level set uh, an, a system that is deeply broken and uneven in a lot of places. And one of the next components after we ask the question of what is it that students should know and be able to do is what is it that the teachers should know and be able right. to do. We can begin to answer that question. And that's what our INTAS group, the Interstate Teacher Assessment and Standards Co Consortium has been working on in partnership uh, with AACTE and a number of others. And they're beginning to start to develop these models of teacher effectiveness that I think are going to get us a long way toward what, you're, to, toward what we're all working toward. The other piece, though, that I think is important in this sort of plan from standard to assessment to supports that go along with those assessments uh, uh, is, is transparency, is this idea of mapping, of laying out then how is it that students, so that you can know uh, that children who are 10 years old in this particular environment are doing this well in their digital learning progressions versus those that are in this environment. And then, what kinds of resources do we recruit right. to try and solve those, to, right. to problem solve those sorts of situations? Uh, so the data transparency component of this is absolutely critical. Uh, and uh, it is a piece of the, the plan that the, the chiefs are beginning to work on collectively. They realize that them just putting out a, a notion of how a particular school is doing in a particular setting doesn't begin to change the national conversation, that there needs to be national comparability. Uh, and they're working towards common data standards. They're working towards uh, a, a number of other pieces that are important so that these sorts of visualizations of how uh, uh, students are performing can be made real. So Susan, when we did this meeting in 1992, and they talked about uh, media education, that kind of thing, and, and the teachers of educa the, the education schools, they thought was it was just so far away from what was going on in education schools in those days. And I guess, uh, my qu at least that was my impression. Uh, and the question is, is there, uh, are, are the schools, the colleges for teacher education, moving uh, rapidly enough in this direction? Uh, and are the teachers ready to engage in this? I mean, they're now younger teachers. They're, they're people who should be digital natives themselves. No, they're not, they're not moving fast enough, but they have come a long way. And the conditions are, are really perfect uh, for right now um, between uh, a very strong administration that is promoting all of this, um, common core standards, which mm -hmm. have a huge emphasis on 21st century skills, even the in-task uh, standards, which are about, they are teacher standards, teaching, uh, standards, all the conditions are right. Um, right now, the teacher preparation uh, profession has a very strong agenda for <coughs> civic engagement and, um, and social justice. And that's really historically been the case. And I'm not so, so much worried about um, media literacy, which is not a brand new concept no. for these institutions, as I am the digital literacy mm -hmm. and others. About a year and a half ago, we started, we put together a task force in partnership with the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, and we just published a white paper ourselves, which is unique in that it is really focused and targeted to our own member um, institutions. And it is, it's sort of not exactly a blueprint 
but a starting plan for really transforming their programs, embedding the technology in there, and developing models of instruction um, along with assessments so that the teachers they're producing <coughs> can go into the K-12 <coughs> arena uh, not only being able to use the technology, they know how to do that when they arrive now, but knowing how to use it in a way that's going to move the needle and help students do better. Um, I, I do think in, in the conversation, and what I like so much about your paper, um, is that you do talk about media literacy because I think it gets lost in, in the larger conversation. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity uh, for our institutions maybe to help to get that word out. I also think all of the work that you're doing here is going to support their efforts as well. Um, so, so, so this proposal support interdisciplinary bridge building. Yes. Now my, my, I was in academia and interdisciplinary <laughs> was like, everybody talked about it and it didn't, it didn't it's much It's not happen. enough. It's, it's just not Kate? enough. Kate? <clears throat> so I'm Kate Auger and I'm with the Education and Labor Committee. Um, I, I think that um, as far as teacher education, I really liked the recommendations. I think that um, it's important to recognize that it plays a pivotal part, not only in the teacher prep programs, but also in professional development. Um, I think we expect so much of our teachers, and they have limited time to accomplish all that we expect of them. Mm -hmm. And so really the interdisciplinary piece of that is an important part and digital um, media can do that. I think that um, in addition to having access, the ability to use it and making sure in the prep and the PD that they learn the knowledge and skills to actually make use of it in the classroom is an incredibly important part and to model that. So if I'm a teacher and I have a whiteboard and I have broadband but I don't know how to use it, it's not doing anyone any good. Um, so you can use that to do a virtual tour of the Smithsonian Museums or the Library of Congress, but unless we've actually made sure that they have that knowledge and skill set to do that, it really yeah. doesn't translate. Yeah. And not only that, but to Ellen's point, it, it can really be, once the teachers have that knowledge and skill set, an incredibly effective tool to communicate with parents and engage the community. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that we need to empower teachers with those skills, and then they can also help facilitate and empower the parents and teachers in their communities with that same skill set and really open up that conversation. What's so fascinating about that, Kate, is how we've been experimenting actually having kids use flip cameras to document classroom practice, mm -hmm. which then becomes a tool for parent communication. It becomes a staff development tool for like what worked here and what didn't work. And then when we put it online, it then lets us share across communities of practice. So the online video documentation turns out to be a really simple design mm -hmm. dimension that has a powerful impact across a whole range of transforming classroom practice. So, so that, I forget who made the point, so I apologize, but someone mentioned about having access. I mean, with all that we're expecting teachers to do, making it easy for them to access and see what other people are doing and seeing those models out there and opening up conversations among educators so that they can share their ideas and their experiences and learn from one another and just making that easy, I think would be an incredibly so, Chris, powerful. Yeah, are, are you doing that? that point, because that's so critical, the ease of access point. So I'm also our research director at the council. And one of the things that we started looking at was higher performing nations and the level of burden that we place on our teachers in classrooms. Finland is the clear international leader on OECD comparisons. The average number of hours spent in instruction in Finland is half the number of hours that are spent in instruction by our teaching staff. Yep. And OECD average countries, uh, the, the, those nations that are outperforming us by significant margins, on average they're spending about uh, they're in between that, that gap of 100% of, of between us and Finland, right. uh, with us being the clear overburdeners yep. of teachers. Yep. So we have to make this. Yeah, time to plan is absolutely fundamental to being able to take advantage of innovation. So are you, are you making that accessible? Are you forming a CCSSO, an organization that is actually doing what Kate is calling for? So 
we're, yes, we're pushing on that kind of thinking. One of the things that we want to make available is once you have these visualizations of how it is that students are performing against standard, you can begin to immediately click on that standard and see right behind it the content resources that are necessary to begin instructing that standard, the content resources that you might deploy to the child, him or herself, the ways in which you might approach a whole suite, a whole taxonomy of tools that would be available to the, to the instructor that's trying to, to work through that material. Uh, we think that's a critical set of supports that we need to make available. So I want to advocate for uh, not that particular, but in general, teachers don't know this. Yeah. All of these resources are out there, but they don't know they exist. Mm -hmm. So I mean, letting teachers know that these supports are out there and people are working on them and, and giving them that information. So, so who, who does that? I mean, how do we get this done? Well, there are many is the next is the next step. I mean, who can uh, reaches all the teachers? Uh, yes. Well, I think you know. Uh, I hate to say national, but there are national organizations right. with members locally, and I think you know, getting the principals in, the administrators, even the unions, right. um, on some of this, you know, uh, less uh, <laughs> whatever on the. Uh, I think that if you get all of these, um, and it's a handful really, it's not that many, maybe eight, um, to begin to um, not only funnel the information down, but embed it in their regular meetings and conferences with presentations. Uh, we just, at our association, launched a social networking platform so that we can have discussions and build uh, you know, communities of practice around certain topics. Um, I think all of this is really doable and not terribly expensive. Um, time consuming, so, yes. So really it's a matter of who does that. I, I agree with you, mm -hmm. but somebody has to sort of take it on and do it at, you know, at a large level. I mean, well, I, certainly, I mean, I'm not the education person here, but we know, we all know that education is a state, uh, state mandated, mandated. What if we did something with what if we did something with, and who makes the decisions about curricula is the chief state school officers. So if, you know, I would suggest doing a series of educational um, summits like this, one for the chief state school officers. We, we have a partnership with the National Education Association, which is pretty much you know, if that, if not that, then AFT. Um, and I think we, we do it also with you know, the Girl Scouts, for example, which we have a partnership with on media literacy. You, I think this has to be a grassroots, roots and grass tops right. effort. And again, the concept, it happily, is not that complicated. Yeah. Um, uh, Lindsay, I haven't had a chance to hear from you yet. Sure. I'm Lindsay Berger from the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. I just wanted to speak to um, the importance of the community factor in all of this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you know about the Joint Center, but we work primarily with African American um, communities, communities of color. And what we have found in our research is that you know you, you can give someone a computer, but if they don't have digital media literacy behind it, they don't need it. So this right. part is becomes so much more important to make sure that this educational component with it. It's the on ramp to broadband adoption. And if we want people to be involved citizens, we need them to have connections and anchor institutions like libraries, places to go to access broadband internet. So it kind of comes down to, you know, um, I wish Nicole was here. She actually could not make it, and she sends her regards. But she was involved with One Economy and the Digital Connectors Program, which was referenced um, in this work. And that just showed that, you know, the, the young um, individuals who were involved in the program, you know, they did teach their communities how to use the Internet. They were the ones who sort of started that conversation and brought the, the broadband to their communities. So I think that we... It is wonderful to talk about how students can help teachers to learn. There is that learning component, and it isn't, it's no longer structured in the old-fashioned way of teacher to student. Now it is student to teacher, and vice versa. Okay. Uh, I'm going to call on Josh. Then, Dean, I'd like for you to also uh, address, if we need to move to research and assessment, you might actually have a, a, a thought about, you know, some thoughts about that. And then I want to get people to you know, go around and say, is there something that you can do uh, going out of here. Uh, well, I wanted to bring in something that uh, Renee and I were discussing earlier, which is the Broadband Technology Opportunities Program, um, touching also on what Lindsay was just saying, and that a lot of the recommendations are in action in a lot of these programs. And I, and I would say that as far as a, a national down payment goes, 
when Congress, Congress made that down payment when it included adoption uh, as part of the, part of the VTOP program. Um, and I think that, that we should really look to those programs uh, and the curricular resources that they're generating, the evaluation methodologies that they're generating, uh, and uh, see a lot of the models of what we're talking about that will be implemented over the course of the next two years and what we can learn and draw and compile from that. Okay. Andy? Yeah, and um, one more note on, um, on teacher preparation. I think what Jessica was talking to and, and Chris and Susan is our opportunity to do mass customization. So what Globaloria is modeling, although it's not touched in this report, is a new model of networking teachers and offering a way of doing digital citizenship, digital literacy, civic literacy, news literacy, and then saying, are you a biology teacher? We can customize it for you. Are you a social studies seventh grade teacher? This can be customized for you. Do you want to align it to the content standards of 21st century, global 21 of West Virginia? We can do it for you. And we're gonna, we, the, the idea that when it's networked and transparent, the teachers themselves were crowdsourcing it to them, and they begin to build the models of the, the digital and media literacy practices that they do, and I think that transparent environment is extremely important because it's not just learning about, it's about learning to be. And the teachers are digital learners and they are digital citizenship uh, um, kind of practitioners. And, I, and, and to just to add to this is, is the idea that it is um, really important that teachers are considered here as learners uh, in the same way, and I think what Globalora is trying to prove is that we took a very advanced, complex, constructionist, project-based approach to digital media and literacy, uh, uh, digital and media literacy, or digital citizenship, and we proved that we take the non-techie so teachers from low-income schools, both urban and rural schools, the ones who, are, who can be 50 or 60, and we transform them. And I want you to really look at Global Lawyer as a model because it's actually talking about this transparency and networking and customization of a rather complex flavor of these projects. And then also takes us to research and assessments. The research are also, in, the, the teachers are also encouraged to develop the new assessments and evaluation rubrics, try it in their classrooms, and then distribute them to other teachers in the classroom. They are using the flip cameras, like what you were saying, and they're uploading, and I think these networks exist. YouTube is there, Google Tools and Google Docs and Google Apps are there. So, so in other words, you think that the developing, uh, there are online measures of media and digital literacy to assess learning? <coughs> They have to. They're already there. They're, yeah, Global Aura is definitely a model for how they do it, and then we can extract from it. Okay. But important so, is the idea that it's lifelong teacher prep, not just the young ones. It's, okay. it's need to happen all the time. So let's see if anybody else has a comment on the uh, online measures for uh, media and digital literacy to assess uh, the learning progression. Um, it's something you you feel is very important um, that needs to be done. There's I, one model there, yes. I, not to say that there aren't, but I'm going to say this so that Kate doesn't have to. I've talked to a lot of people on the Hill about digital media and digital media literacy as an issue, that, especially to people working in education on Capitol Hill. And the first question you get back is, can you prove that this changes learning? Can you prove that this changes student achievement? And I don't want, I'm, I'm saying that as a devil's advocate. I don't think that is the core issue. I do think this will have an impact on learning. But until we start crossing some of those thresholds with some proof of the impact this has about their immediate concerns, we're going to run into some real walls. Okay. I'm going to uh, turn now, and we have 10 minutes left, uh, and just go around and see if people uh, have any uh, takeaways that they want to suggest, you know, things that they might do uh, leaving this meeting that would advance the things that have come out in the, uh, in the dialogue over the last uh, uh, hour and a half. And let me begin with uh, our FCC commissioner. Well, I think a number of things. I talked about <coughs> one of them earlier, so I won't revisit that uh, now. But certainly, uh, thanks to the National Broadband Plan, which Blair was so instrumental in crafting, I think uh, we did help put this issue before the American people, and we need to, to ramp up that effort and follow through on, uh, uh, on that effort. So the uh, educational role, the convening role, I think, uh, is an important one. 
people talk about working with the uh, media companies, and uh, yes, we can do that, but uh, our writ doesn't run too far right now with a lot of media companies, and getting product placement for digital literacy is kind of an uphill uh, battle, I would say, uh, unless we figure a way to uh, uh, craft some policy that either encourages or mandates media new and old to uh, be attentive to the issues of digital and media literacy, and I think we have to have a serious uh, national conversation on that. I think we have to look again at uh, uh, maybe some guidelines or some standards for uh, public service uh, announcements and things like that. So there's a whole raft of things that the FCC uh, can do, uh, and we're launched on that, but as I said before, if we're going to talk about it as a priority, we ought to act like it's a priority. Good. Amy? <coughs> IMLS. IMLS. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, the broadband plan um, asks IMLS to develop, work with public libraries and community-based organizations to develop some standards on digitally inclusive communities. Uh, it talks about you know number of computers and policies around their use and, and uh, speed, et cetera. Uh, but we're taking a little bit larger frame on this around uh, what do um, what do policymakers, resource allocators need to know about their communities and need to pay attention to so that they are digitally inclusive communities and certainly digital literacy and media literacy resources and support as a part of that. Uh, so we've just had our uh, initial conversation to develop a framework that eventually these standards will grow from um, and we're working with the University of Washington and the International City and County Managers Association that Susan mentioned earlier. Uh, but I anticipate being in touch with many of you around the table, so I thank you uh, uh, f uh, for this. Uh, the other thing is we're working with the MacArthur Foundation on developing some learning laboratories in museums and libraries. There really are about digital literacy. Some of it's taking off from the U Media uh, model <coughs> at Chicago Public, uh, but also some models about um, digital literacy and learning in uh, museums. Uh, so this concept uh, that goes from um, digital and media literacy to, I think, the citizenship uh, issue is really, really important to build into, you know, we've been talking about museums and libraries as places of using technology for making and doing, but also uh, of being uh, a contributing citizen, I think is really important, and your concept of an online, uh, who you are as an online citizen, I think is, is really important to that work, so thank you. Okay, now let me just say that uh, I started this, I'm realizing everybody, uh, so we're not going to be able to do it for everybody, but um, why don't I just ask people who, you know, have some, some statement of, you know, what their organization uh, they think can do going forward on implementing some of these things, uh, maybe uh, speak up, because we, I do want to end on time. So let's get the American Library Association, we have the president and vice president. Well, we have a pretty powerful network for getting information out, so I, we would love to work with, uh, with you. And if you can be sure to share, I, there's a thing I see going on that we've got to be sure to link, it's, uh, both in terms of the education, we've got to link the libraries, librarians and teachers. It's really got to be part of both curricula. I mean, we do make it part of it, but we got to make sure that this is really a close cl uh, crossover. With 122,000 school libraries, we got to make sure everybody is uh, pulling together on this one. So uh, that's what I think that uh, you know we really, really need to connect on in a very powerful way. And it's also going on in academic libraries too, because we have a lot of kids coming into the college environment who are not prepared in the literacy. That's so, for sure. so that's where I think we can really um, mm -hmm. be strong together. Um, other, yes, so, okay, Margie. Yeah, I'm uh, Marika Visser, and I'm also with ALA. I work here in the Washington office, uh, usually with telecom, but we also do a lot with digital literacy. And something that we're working on in particular in our office is sort of uh, local, trying to figure out how to do the mapping piece for the library community, it um, spurned out of the broadband plan, the, the 9.3 recommendation, which says, you know, the digital literacy core and everything. And so what we want to do is understand where libraries are already doing this.
piece. And so um, we're starting an initiative to try and gather that very information in the library community. But I really like the recommendation to have that networked teaching community. And as Roberta was saying, librarians can be a really strong player in that. A lot of digital media happens in the, in the school. It happens in the library, in the school library. So uh, we're working with our members to uh, gather the sort of the best practices and then figure out which organizations need to know what library best practices are. We're in conversation with um, some uh, staff at NTIA and also IMLS to uh, work on that kind of mapping thing. We have some libraries that were recipients of the BTOP awards, particularly SBA, the Sustainable Broadband Adoption and the um, Public Computing Center awards and uh, we're going to work on doing some case study type of things with the SBA one in particular to look at what the curriculum is that they developed and so we're, we're starting all that, it's still happening, but are looking to the organizations that would like that information after we gather it. Great. Susan? Can I make just one more comment? Oh, sure. Um, and, and then I'll, you know, I, that we not only have um, a, a big organization ourselves, but we link up to the chapters of the library associations within the state. States. So they're not all members, not all people who belong to those library associations in the states are members of ALA. So I'm just saying this is a huge group. If you work with us, we can really get it out to lots and lots of people. I think that's terrific. I mean, this is a great, it's a great offer. Um, let's, uh, Susan? Um, so I'll just add to the library realm on this a bit. Um, the Open Libraries Council brings together approximately 150 of the largest urban libraries in the U.S. and Canada. And last year, for the first time, we launched an innovations initiative where we asked our members to send us descriptions of some of their leading practice programs. So we're collecting those, and I'm guessing that you all are collecting those same kinds of success stories in your own organization. So I would just encourage us to continue to do that and to share them and to affect one another with our success stories. And let me because just... Because I think many of them connect to all of the, the key strategies we may that you have identified. So uh, one way to do that is that Amy has been blogging on the nightcom.org website and there's plenty of opportunity for putting things in there and uh, dialoguing on that. So that would be one place to start. I think the offer of ALA is just fantastic and you know it's a, it's a great uh, opportunity. Um, Charlie, I just had one more thing yeah. to say and that is that um, this is a wonderful group of people to bring together, to bring together, but I'm sure there are many more people. Oh, yeah. oh that's exactly what I wanted to say. Yeah, sure. And, and um, this morning as I was getting ready for my day, I was listening to NPR, and I heard Google announced that they were giving all of their employees 10% raise. And all of the capital that Google and Apple are sitting upon. I, I know there's all sorts of interesting relationships there, but um, there, there are a lot of people in the business community that you know that are really interested in helping us move this. And so it's just making sure that we're bringing them into the circle as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, now, can I add just a note no, about this? Okay. Facebook has half a billion users. Uh, we have 50,000 Google employees now out there. I think that we all know all the, 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 the millions of users in all the other networks like Twitter and, and, and uh, YouTube, and we have to bring them into this conversation, uh, including the, the, the people who are really in the game industry, which is really large and not represented here, because these are also the networks and the medium that is engaging now both teachers and students and parents. They're there, and so we need to figure out how to spread uh, the action exactly. steps to. Exactly, Susan? Just very quickly, um, several things that I think we can do, but the, your recommendation about uh, a certification for uh, teacher candidates or, or even teachers um, in media literacy, media. Mm -hmm. I love that idea, and I think it's one that we could get some traction for within the teacher prep industry. So I'll definitely be in touch with you to see how maybe you could help us think that out and uh, figure out a way to get that going. Michael Rich? Um, I, I hate to bring up an elephant in the room, but um, I think that one of the things um, we can think about offering is 
um, resources. Um, we haven't talked about how this is all going to get paid for. Um, and uh, that's always the issue. It's been an issue with media literacy since the beginning, which is that we've all jumped into it because, quote, it was the right thing to do. And uh, to speak to Alan's point, I think the other thing that we've sort of failed to do is evaluate effectively, really look at what the goals are as we set these programs out and whether they're met, how they're met, how well they're met, and how we can improve those things, which then feeds back into the definition standardization and mapping issue, mm -hmm. which is what are we doing here, how well are we doing it, and how can we make it better? Because then when you walk up on the hill, you can hand them data. Yeah. And um, as uh, someone who... another reason to turn me down, but... <laughs> right, of course. But, but, but as someone who has gone in and tried to systematically... Um, evaluate some of these programs that are done locally in local schools, um, it's really, really powerful when you can do that, you know, and there are barriers to it, but I think that one of the things that perhaps we can offer from the center is sort of a, um, a, a rigorous way of evaluating programs or working with programs to develop evaluation for them so that then they have something to go back to their funders, because the other issue, of course, is not just initial funding, but sustainability. Right. Uh, I think we're going to really have to, uh, and I've got to call on uh, Renee to just uh, have some uh, summary comments, and we're going to have to we're going to have to wrap it up. So, Renee, um, you started us off. You gave us your your ideas. We've kind of been around the table a couple of times. We've gotten some great offers. We've got a new uh, some new models, some new networks, and um, what are your Final thoughts. It's thrilling, and thank you very much for uh, participating and coming to this and for the good work you do. When I started this journey, I knew that the time is now for digital and media literacy to become a community education movement. I knew that there were enough stakeholders from the full range of communities represented here and and beyond here that are saying the time is right for this. And fortunately, uh, Let a Thousand Flowers Bloom has been very good over the last five to seven years where we've seen a lot of momentum coming from stakeholders. And so I think right now what I feel like is, yeah, this is gonna happen. And I think the trick is how we manage to coordinate and build capacity so that we start to identify you know, what works. So we start to build some traction around what works. Um, but it's thrilling that you were able to participate in this. Um, and thank you, Charlie, for the opportunity. It's really been a pleasure. Well, thank everybody around the table. Thank you for the audience that's, uh, that's watching or listening. But uh, you know, it's just beginning. And thanks to the Knight thank Foundation for Absolutely. supporting us. <laughs> Absolutely, that's the, as a final thing. Okay.